All right, good morning, Vertical Church. Oh, Lord. Good morning, Vertical Church. How are y'all doing at the 9 o'clock service? Okay, there we go. Somebody respond for the 9 o'clock. Give me right, give me right, Doc. All right, so good morning, Vertical Church. As she said, my name is Fred Reed. I get to serve here with our tribal teams with Natasha. There we go. Give it up for tribal teams. So tribal teams, some people ask from time to time. This is pretty much like a missional community for our teenagers here. So if you're not already getting our emails, then let us know, or you can go to verticalnc.org slash the hub. We'll talk about the hub after the service, after the sermon as well. But yeah, sign up. Sign up with the emails. We'll let you know when we're meeting and what we're doing so you can bring your teens to our meetings so that you can start to disciple them as well. And as I said, I serve with Natasha. I appreciate you helping us out with our tribal teens. And shout out to the teens. I know some of y'all are here. Some of y'all are watching. Shout out to the squad. Um, This morning, I'm so thankful for a chance to get into preaching God's Word. Um, A lot has changed since the last time I did that. Um, But before I get into it, I just want to stop to say that I thank God for the gift that he has given me. I thank God for leading me even this moment, uh, this morning, that, again, without him, I would be nothing. I could do nothing. And behind that, I want to thank Pastor Ryan. Thank you, Pastor Ryan, for giving me a chance to share what God has given to me, for entrusting this uh, opportunity to me and walking through this with me. And lastly, I want to thank my wife, Adriana, for supporting me through this process uh, as we kind of put this sermon together together. So I appreciate the pushback that you have for me and just guiding me into what God intended. I love you, girl. Um, So let's get into it. Let's get into it. Uh, What a great job the women have been doing preaching through this Rooted series. Can we give it up for them one more time? Thank you very much. So the only woman in the world that I would marry, she was up here a couple weeks ago, And as Jana said, she talked us through how we can meditate on God's word by establishing some rhythms and some uh, repeated rhythms that we can meditate on God's word and challenge our resolve as it compares to God's word. And how are we doing with that? Is everybody applying that yet? How is our, oof, oof, oof. Okay. All right. All right. We're in the right spot this morning. This sermon is for us then. Thank God. I certainly can do a much better job of establishing a consistency, carving out time for how I'm going to engage with God's word. But as Jana said, the very next week, our discipleship director, Ms. Jana Connor, took us a little further into how we can go deeper into the Word. She provided us with some inductive Bible study tools that we can use so that we're not just reading the Word over and over, hoping that something comes to us, but instead we have some tools that help us guide to find out what was the original writer's intent to their original audience, so then we can bring that to our present day to have an accurate understanding of what the Bible is saying. I know for me, my favorite part of that sermon, Yana, just to let you know, was when you said that when we come to the Word, we have a chance to interact and see the face of God. I'm not sure that I always approach the Bible that way. Pastor Ryan kind of demonstrated a few sermons ago, we tend to kind of run by the Word. I got 15 minutes, let me get a couple verses in, God will be pleased, and I'll keep it moving. But to think I have a chance to sit before God and see Him for who He is, His heart, His character towards me, his will for the world, if I sit down with his word and really wrestle with it, I have a chance to do that. So I thank you for challenging us in that regard. And now this morning, your boy gets a chance to contribute. I get a chance to add a little something, something on the back end. And I thank Pastor Ryan for giving me application because this is something I'm very passionate about. It was almost difficult to put this sermon together because application is just so important to me. It doesn't matter how much you know if you're not going to do it. Maybe y'all can tell, I've been in the gym a little more this year, you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to get a little discipline going. <laughs> stay with me, stay with me. I'm trying, to, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to build some discipline now. I want to make sure I have something that I stick with, even if it's difficult, even if we're on vacation, even if I don't feel like doing it, I need discipline. I want it to spill over into my budget. I want it to spill over into how I love my wife, how I pursue God. And so one of the easiest things I could think of that's hard, that nobody likes to do, but it is beneficial to do it, is working out. It's working out. And so when you're working out, everybody's constantly, what's the best workout plan? And how do you do this? And how do you do that? And a wise man in the gym once said, the best workout plan you can do, get your notes out. I know you want to know. What's the best one that you can do is the one you'll actually do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the one that you'll stick with, the one that you'll do it week in and week out. Whether you got to go late at night, early in the morning. I work, we went to the beach about a week ago, five o'clock in the morning. I'm up working out. I come home and I'm just like, hey, we're on vacation. Don't you want to stay in the bed? Yes. Yes, I want to stay in the bed. But I'm challenging myself that, hey, I want to show up for this thing. This is something that I want to do consistently. So this morning, I want to kind of tell you, like I said, a lot have changed 
since I last preached, my beautiful wife, Adriana, told y'all, since I was last up here, we had a baby. And then another baby 13 months later. And so I'm a parent now, y'all. I'm a parent. There are two people in this world that call me dad, and I still haven't got used to that quite yet. And in my parenting, I've learned so much about life. I've learned a lot about God. And specifically what I want to share is um, I've learned about my kids. They kind of have special skin. It gets a little dry. It gets a little itchy. And I can't really relate to that. So I kind of struggle with how exactly should we approach this. We've sought out some medical professionals. And at one point, my son, Nathaniel, was really having a rough go of it. He was just breaking out, really itchy. And Oz was not there. So I had to, hey, it was on me. I had to figure it out. I had to figure it out. So I go upstairs. I don't know which doctor gave it to us, which ointment it was. Pray for me. Pray for me as a dad. I'm just out there grabbing stuff. Like, bro, I mean, what you think? You know, he was looking at me like, how would he know? So I read the prescription, and it's pretty straightforward. It says just open it, take it out, look at the broken areas on his skin, the troubled areas, and apply it generously. So that's what I do. I take it out, and I'm just kind of just getting it all in there, just slathering it on. And while it wasn't a comfortable process for my son, because he trusted me enough to try to bring him some relief, and I saw what the prescription said, but I actually also then did it, he was able to enjoy himself and then further on get some relief and enjoy his life. So as we move further in our sermon series, I think that applies to us. I think as we read God's word, it's good to read it. It's good to study it so we understand it. But essentially, we need to apply it generously. And so far, my title this morning for our time together is to apply generously. After you've read the word, studied the word, make sure you have an accurate interpretation. The challenge now is how do I apply that word? How do I apply this word to my life? So our main idea today, if you have, you know, your your pen, your pencil, or maybe your, your phone. I take a lot of notes on my phone. Get your notes out because good students take notes. Shout out to you, Pastor Ryan, for that one. We're keeping it, keeping it going. Our main idea today is we will be rooted in our relationship with God when we apply God's word to our worldview and lifestyle. We will be rooted in our relationship with God when we apply God's word to our worldview and our lifestyle. Again, it's not just enough, it's not good enough just to know the word, but specifically how does this influence how we see the world and then the way that we actually live. Our decisions should be tied back to what the world says. Instead of finding a new way to approach God and sometimes finding new information, How about we just go back and apply the things that we already know? Amen. So to go through it this morning, there's two points we're going to work through, two key points we're going to work through. One, we're going to listen with AIM. It's going to be an acronym that hopefully you will enjoy. We're going to listen with AIM. Um, And then secondly, we're going to remember to persevere. We're going to remember to persevere. This is the strategy and the way by which we're going to figure out uh, just a kind of starting point of how we can work through applying God's word. Again, being passionate about application My first draft of this sermon was literally about three hours long. I figured they would not only not invite me back, they might kick me out of the church. (laughs) And then God challenged me. God challenged me. I don't have to preach everything I know about application. Just let's get started. Let's get started. These are some beginning initial steps for how we can begin to apply God's word. And so as we go to the word today, we're going to spend our time in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. Matthew chapter 7. Verses 24 through 27, I think this is a good place that demonstrates to us the value of application as it relates to applying what Jesus has said in general, the Bible, the Word, the Word of God. But before we get into Matthew, again, let's practice some of the tools that we've talked about. Let's put Matthew in proper context. So who wrote the book? Who were they originally talking to and what is the purpose? Matthew was written by the disciple named Matthew. He was one of the 12 that followed Jesus originally. And his goal was to convince the Jews of his time that Jesus was the promised Messiah from the Old Testament. He was the one, the fulfillment of the prophesied true deliverance and true peace between God and man given to both Jew and Gentile. And so we have to consider those that are reading this book are those that are familiar with the Pentateuch, the Torah. They think they know how to approach God at this point. These are the Galilean Jews. They're not new kids on the block. So as we go through Matthew, you'll see very intentionally, Matthew ties a lot of what Jesus does back to what we read in the Old Testament. Remember when, you know, Moses said this and this? Well, this is happening right now. Jesus is the one that's doing that. So as we read through Matthew, as we keep in mind, it's not just the simple concepts where we're tying this back to the confidence the Jews have, but also showing that it's a little bit different. As Jesus fulfills this, we're seeing the back end is what we're going to pick up today, the back end of the Sermon on the Mount. 
starts in chapter 5. Great sermon. I dare not pull from one of Jesus' sermons. Can't preach it better than he can. But on the back end, we're kind of coming to the end of him wrapping it up, him getting to the application. So hopefully you've had time now to pull up Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. I'll read it for you. Let's read together. <clears throat> Everyone then, these are the words of Jesus, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone then who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. If you don't mind, we'll take a minute to pray as we go forward in this sermon. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Father, we thank you for meeting us here in this moment. Even now, Lord, I pray that only as you can do, Lord, that we all hear the same sermon, yet it speaks to us in different ways. I pray, Lord, that this sermon is an answer to prayers that people have had, God, that it brings both clarity and confidence, Lord, in who you are and your intentions towards us. And I pray, Lord, that you give us practical steps, Lord, even as the sermon goes forth, Bring back to our spirits, bring back to our mind what you have already given for us to do, and give us courage and confidence, Lord, that you will do those things through us. You simply want us to trust you in all things. Father, I pray that you give me boldness of speech and clarity of mind. I submit myself to you now, Lord. Whatever you would choose to do, I follow you, Father. I know that I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. I cannot do this on my own. But with you, Lord, I know it will be great. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Let's get into our first point here. We want to listen with aim. We want to listen with aim. Here we pretty much just want to focus on consuming the word with the intention to respond to the word. Listen with aim. Our listening is aimed at something. I'm hearing this because I'm going to do something with it. We want to be careful of coming to the Bible like we do a lot of other books, simply just to learn. I want to be careful here. It is good to learn about the Word. Don't leave her saying, Fred told me I don't need to learn nothing. No, 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 no. Bring that back. Bring that back. It is good. It's great to learn things about the Bible. It's great to know the Greek. It's great to know the original audience. It's great to know the connections that are there. But ultimately, the goal is to respond to what we now know. So now I just want to kind of challenge this early. Does our life reflect the knowledge that we have of God? Can you look at the decisions that I make, and it points to once I learn this about God, or once I learn this about myself, as we look in the Word, we can learn a lot about our intentions, our goals, our pitfalls, and knowing that thing, how do I then respond? I can't speak for you, but I know a lot of times I think the gap is I just need to know a little bit more. Some of us won't lead a B group quite yet because I just need to know more Bible. If I knew more Bible, if I had more of it memorized, then I could lead a D group. There's things that we're trying to stop doing, certain sins we're trying to turn away from. And we think, if I could just read more Bible, then I'll stop doing these things. But I challenge you, I'll push back on that to say, maybe the biggest gap isn't what you know, but what you'll obey. Maybe it's just, if you took the little bit of Bible that you consider yourself to know now and actually did that, I think you'd be surprised at what God can do, even through that. All God ever wants from us is a submissive yes Not all the brain knowledge, not all the head knowledge, not everything memorized. You don't have to be a theologian to be a disciple of Christ. What you know, put that into acting. So our transformation is in our application. That's one of the main focuses we're going to build on today. If you forget everything else, come back to this. Our transformation, if we want to be changed, if we want to be made into the image of God's dear son, Christ Jesus, we must start to apply God's word. So let's get some low-hanging fruit. As people that have been graced by God and graciously forgiven by God, do we extend grace? Do we extend grace? Don't stop there. The way God extends grace. Ooh, I know. My eyebrows went up too when I read that. I said, Lord, I don't want to write that one down. Because anybody that knows me knows I'm not for the disrespect. I'm not for it. You disrespect me, I feel like God is calling me. To let you know, there's some people you can't try. You try me, I'm doing God's will. I'll make sure you know. Don't you ever try another person like you just tried me. But then God reminds me, Fred, how many times have you come to me disrespectful, disobedient, and yet I offered you grace? 
I say, you're God. You got to do that. What do you mean? But if my intention is to be godly, if my intention is to show that I'm serious about my walk with Christ, I must now also be gracious. And I'll be honest with you, it doesn't come naturally, at least not for me. I don't wake up one day like, you know what? My goals do exactly what God wants. I just feel it burning out of me. I want to do what God wants me to do. Instead, I have to pray, God, today, remind me, show me, walk with me based on the things that I already know. So how do we do this? How do we come to the Word with a format, a plan, a strategy, some steps we can put in place to make sure that we apply what we have learned? Again, I want us to aim at it. So we'll say what these are. We want to listen attentively. We want to listen attentively. That is our A. A is for attentive. Our I is investigate. We still want to make sure we investigate what we are reading when we come to the Word to make sure we understand it. But intentionally, I want to make sure we move after we've investigated and heard what's in the Word. Have an intentional plan. Now that I know this, this is what I plan to do differently. We want to listen attentively. We want to investigate. And then we want to move. So our attentive listening. This is a focused listening committed to engagement and action. Engagement and action. So I will take into the Greek on this one. It's like a second ago I said, you know, the Greek is great, but we got to move on it. But the Greek is still great. So the Greek word here that Jesus uses in referencing this listening refers to somebody that is not distracted, and their intention is once they've heard this and they understand it, they intend to apply and comprehend and move on it. Now, again, we can do this in all of our relationships, but particularly if you're married, if you've been married for about 47 to 73 days, you got an idea of what there's different types, different layers of listening when it comes to marriage. I love my wife. There are times when she's talking, I can tell, oh, you're just talking at me. You just want to get this out. It could be about me. It could be about work. I'm listening, but I just want you to get it all out. And then there's other times when she's saying things to me because at the end, she wants me to do something with what she just said. And sometimes I miss that one. Sometimes I think it's the first one. It's the second one. And then next Wednesday, when I show up to her, a spot with the kids, and she's like, did you bring the thing? What, what, what thing are you talking about? And at that point, she turns into a cartoon, and steam comes out of her ears. And I say, be gracious like God, babe. Be gracious like God. <laughs> but no, she talked to me. She was speaking to me, and she expected me to hear what she said and then move on it. Take it and do something with what I just heard. And if I know her expectation is I got to do something with what she said, I'm going to listen a little differently. I'm going to listen a little differently. I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to make sure that what I'm hearing is actually something I can understand and then move on. So I, que I question you now, Vertical Church, just to consider, what are you hearing? What are you hearing? What is competing with God's voice in your life right now? Because I can guarantee you this, there is something or somebody that you listen to in an undistracted way with the intention to respond. I have the mic, I'll go first. Sometimes for me, it's my own voice. I listen to what I say about myself more than what I listen to what God says about me. And the trick there is I'll either think too much of myself, be overconfident, oh yeah, I got this, only to realize I don't, or I'll be too critical of myself. I'll put ungodly pressure on myself. I'll expect more out of me than God does. And so I'm constantly disappointed. And so it's hard to trust a God that says that he loves me if I constantly feel like I can't do anything right. I mess everything up. There's no need of me even trying because I just mess everything up. If I listen to that, I'll respond to that. Maybe it's your parents or whoever, you know, took care of you when you grew up. Maybe you hear their voice constantly in your head. Maybe you're trying to prove right what they said about you when they said you're a great child and you do everything wonderful. Or maybe you're trying to prove them wrong, that you're different than how they identified you. Maybe that's the pushing force that you hear that causes you to respond. Maybe it's your bank account. <laughs> Maybe you check your bank account, and not only do you make decisions for your budget, I'm not saying it's wrong to budget based on what you're making and live within your means, but instead I'm saying it's different when your bank account defines you and causes you to put God somewhere else from the center of our lives. It's easy to check your balance and say, man, I wish I had more. What do I have to do to make more money? And now the thing that we were already doing with God takes a back burner and then another back burner and then another back burner because I'm listening to what my bank account says more so than what, I'm, what God is saying. Maybe it's popular culture. 
the fact that everybody agrees on this thing today, knowing in five years everybody will think the exact opposite thing tomorrow, but we don't want to stand out. We don't want to stand on what God has said because then people won't like us. Then they'll make assumptions about us. So I just challenge you to think, what is the thing for you that you listen to right now, undistracted, focused, and in a way that causes you to respond? Here at Vertical Church, we want to help you hear properly. We want to help you hear properly. So listening in community is a great way to make sure that you're accurately hearing and responding to God's word. Two ways that we do that here is D-groups and missional communities. D-groups and missional communities. Each week in these D-groups and missional communities, we're going to open the Bible, we're going to read through the word. And then from there, we're going to make a plan of how do you choose to respond to this word. And in D-groups and missional communities, we have accountability. <laughs> I'm thankful for my D group. I'm thankful for my mission and community because there are times in which I hear the word of God, but I hear it a little cloudy. I come ambitiously looking for God to justify my actions instead of understanding who he is. I make the text more about me than it is about God. And my mission and community, my D group, they can tell me, I don't think that's quite what that says. I think you're kind of hearing that a little muddy. Or beyond that, when I say, hey, I'm going to respond to this this week, by being more generous. I'm going to do this for my wife. I'm going to do this for my kids. I'm going to do this at work. The accountability is when I show up next time, somebody's going to ask me, hey, the thing you said you were going to do last week, did you do that? I don't want us to hear that confrontationally. They're not trying to embarrass me or say, you know, you're inconsistent. But instead, they are encouraging me to trust God at his word. If we apply and follow what God has laid out in his word, we will get godly results. And more importantly, sometimes me seeing what God is doing in your life encourages me. If I'm obedient like that, God will do the same thing through me. So in missional communities and D groups, we can hear in community, and we can make sure we have some sense of accountability to make sure we are moving forward in a way that is loyal and right to the text. And then we want to investigate. We want to investigate God's word. It kind of goes back to what Yana had pointed out when the ladies preach so good, you got to go back to what they said because it's right. <laughs> It's good things, that's right. So we want to dig into the word. And I want to point out here, it is going to take some time. Our investigation process is going to take some time. And so let's dig into this text. As we look at this Matthew text that Jesus is describing, for us, it's kind of simple. Like, why would somebody build on the sand? That example is a little on the nose there, Jesus Christos. Nobody would build on sand. Everybody knows to build on rock. But again, for our original Galilean Jew audience, they would have known by the Galilean Sea, in the summer, the sand is hard enough that you can build on it. In that season, that's a good decision. It's cheaper. It's easier. It's quicker. Sounds like me. <laughs> what's easy, what's quick, and going to cost the least amount of money. So I might have built my house on the sand, but a more wise builder knew if I want my house to withstand beyond this season, I need to dig in several feet into the sand to find the bedrock. And I question you now, I challenge you, Vertical Church, to do the same thing in our approach to the Bible. Surface level knowledge is okay. But as we dig into the Word, we'll find out that we can apply it to our lives similar to how it was applied originally. But most importantly, on the other side of that, inappropriate interpretation of the Word will always lead to inaccurate application of the Word. If we interpret it wrong, there's no way we can apply it right. Can we be honest about the universal church, the big C church? Traditionally, the church has certainly taken some scriptures out of context and then misrepresented it God's character and God's design. And this sometimes is the very reason why some people won't come here on a Sunday morning. They've seen people say, well, the Bible says this, and so that means that, and we've used that to weaponize it against other people. Instead of representing a, a holy God, that has a standard, but will graciously walk us through what his standard is. But if we misinterpret the word because we don't dig into it, we won't apply it properly. I know for me, I certainly have done that. I have eisegeted certain texts, which means I just made it about me. If I say this thing, then God's going to do that thing. And I come to the Bible again with ambition. I want to make more money. Where are the scriptures about how to make more money? The Bible says if I do this, then God's got to do that. Well, God, I'm doing the thing. Where's my money at? But is that really what God wanted for me when I sat down and got into his word? For me to try to twist his arm? For me to create this transactional relationship with God? If I do this, then you have to do that. God, you have to do that. 
But on the other end of it, if I don't do my part, then I don't want to talk to God because I haven't done my part, so he won't bless me. And now distance is created based off this misinterpretation and inaccurate application. So again, I want us to be careful. Let's dig into the word. So Yana gave us several inductive Bible study tools, whether it's the SOAP method or SWORD or HERE, that make sure you sit down and take time to see what does this actually mean. Because the interpretation is universal. It means one thing. (laughs) But the application is deeply personal. It varies for all of us based on where we are in a certain season. For example, the Bible calls us to love our wives. Husbands, we must love our wives as Christ has loved the church and gave himself for her. That's what we all must do. But how you love your wife, I can't quite love my wife the same way. So that interpretation is the same. We all must love our wives. But now I must figure out what's the best way to make sure my wife feels loved in a way that Christ has loved the church. We got two little people now that are trying to figure out how to be people. So a lot of times loving my wife is, hey, babe, sit down. I got this. I'll take care of these kids. You go out and do something. And by the time you come back, they'll be asleep. Well, if you don't have little kids, you can't do that move. You can't take that move, brother. That ain't going to work. You got to figure out something else. So universally, we are all called to love our wives. But what that looks like depends on where we are with our relationship and where we are in that particular season. Same thing for all scriptures. We have to figure out what is the accurate interpretation. And then the application looks different for each of us. So let's move on to move. Let's move to move. This is an intentional plan of how we're going to respond to this new information about God or ourselves, an intentional plan of how we're going to move forward with this new information about God or ourselves. We have to connect this new information to our perspective and our worldview. This is how we can avoid saying things like, I know what the Bible says, but, and then you're going to say it's your own thing. (laughs) Instead, we want to get planted in God's word. We want to be rooted to him by saying, I know what I feel, but I know what the Bible says. If our application is always based on how we feel, it will always be inaccurate. It will always be inconsistent. Our feelings are real. They are true. I don't want you to feel like you don't feel the way that you feel. But the deepest level of truth that never changes is God's word. And so we want to move on that. We want to move on what Jesus has actually said. The question I typically ask myself, you can borrow it. I love y'all. Y'all can have it. You don't have to cite your sources. It's fine. I always ask myself after I read a text, if this is true, what am I going to do with it? If what Jesus is saying, if what he is teaching about me and my ambition and my desires, if what he's teaching about being the son of God and what God is going to do ultimately in the end, if this is true, what do I need to do with this? Typically, you can find a few immediate actions for how you want to respond to that. But don't worry, I have a textual example for that as well. If we look at the verses just above our main verses today, so still in Matthew 7, we're going to go with verses 21 through 23. They'll be on the screens for you as well. Still Jesus talking. Verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? and cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Wow, that escalated quickly. (laughs) These people go from calling Jesus Lord, Lord, to Jesus treating most of these random uncles that have cookout for me. is like, I don't know you, brother. (laughs) Back up a little bit. This is Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who loves us so much. In our main text, he's calling people foolish. (laughs) And now in our secondary text, he's calling people lawless and saying he doesn't know them. But look at the indiscretion here, the inconsistency. It starts off by what they say versus what they actually do. Again, we're talking to Jews that would have known the way to God. So they know to say that Jesus is Lord or to submit to the lordship of God is a good thing to do. But when we look at their actions, they did not do the will of God. That's the first thing Jesus describes about these people. So, yes, they call him Lord. But they don't follow him. I can guarantee you, if you follow Jesus Christ, the one place you will be is in the will of God. So for them not to do the will, they weren't following. He wasn't Lord. But then they run the resume. Lord, look at what I've done. I've done this thing. I've done that thing. And then Jesus still responds to them, depart from me. I never knew you. If we want to avoid that confusion and that duality, we want to make sure that we actually make Jesus Lord. 
I know for me, I've certainly had seasons where my mouth calls them Lord, but my life calls them my last option. If everything else doesn't work, all right, let me try this Jesus thing. But if you talk to me about Jesus, yeah, he's the Lord of all. He created everything. He died for us. He's coming back. But the first time I run into some difficulty, I'm planning my own plan. I'm not going to what Jesus said. I'm not worried about what the Bible details in this way. I'm not going to my community to help me and pray with me. I'm doing my own thing. So how? How can he be Lord when at the same time I'm running my life? It's a tough truth, but it's tight, but it's right. And perhaps the most convicting thing about these lawless ones, the way that Jesus describes their end, is they miss the opportunity to know him. Vertical Church, as I've matured in my walk with Christ, the main thing that I want is to know him. I want to know him when I'm on the mountaintop and everything's going great. All the decisions are going wonderful. I want to know him when I'm in my valleys and it seems like I can't get anything right and everything is surprising me. I want him to comfort me in those moments. I want to know him on the day-to-day when I'm just trying to figure out what exactly is going on here, to see him walking with me and guiding me. Above all else, I want to know him. And they missed that opportunity. They had the information. They knew to call him Lord. They knew to approach him as Lord. But they were an application away from knowing him. Our transformation is in our application. As we seek to apply this word, it will take God for us to do it. And in walking with God daily to see, oh, wow, I really am the way you said I am in the Bible. We'll also see, oh, wow, you really do what you said you would do in the Bible. And the courage and the confidence that comes from applying this text, and I see something new about God. I want to apply another text, and I see something new about God. And now I have a chance to make disciples that make disciples because we're all following what God originally laid out. Let me take a time out, flag on the play, commercial break. Let me make this clear. This is not works righteousness. I don't want anybody to think that I'm saying your salvation is based on whether you apply the Bible or not. There is no particular action that you can do that can make you saved or make you unsaved. Jesus has paid the price for us. He came and died on our behalf, rose again from the dead, accepted by God as our perpetuation for our sins. The payment is made. Instead, what I'm saying is if we want to mature in Christ, If we want to know him and be formed into his image, then yes, we have to apply. So don't get me wrong. Don't think that, man, I don't even know if I'm saved anymore or not. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, risen from the dead, you're in the fold. If you confess that with your mouth and believe in your heart, you are with us. And now we want you to grow. (laughs) We want you to stay rooted in God, and we want you to grow. So approaching the text with a genuine curiosity is a great way for gaining understanding But an understanding without action is defined by Jesus as foolish. If you understand the information and you have the information but do nothing with it, that's foolish. But think of little Nate. If that's not quite making sense for you, think of little Nathaniel, my little son. If I read his prescription while he's aching and pain, itching, and I read it and I understood, okay, take it out. Let me put it on the boy. He's good to go. And then I walked out the room, got it. I read it. I got it. I'm going to tell my wife about how it works. But I don't put it on him. Where is the relief? How can the actual lotion and ointment work if I don't put it on them, if I don't apply it? Same thing with our approach to the word. It's great to read it. It's great to study it. But there's so much more to be gained about God, not ambitiously trying to get our hopes and dreams to come true. There's so much more to be gained about God if we actually apply what's in the word. So at this point, I just kind of want to transition to my last point. Remember to persevere. Remember to persevere. Stick with me. Remember to persevere. Our commitment to enduring challenges by applying God's word, even in the difficult times, but also our strategy to preserve, persevere through these moments is to remember who God is. So when I say remember to persevere, I'm kind of coming at it both ways. I want you to know up front, it will be difficult to apply God's word in certain seasons. It'll be uncomfortable. You might not want to do it. It'll cause some arguments. It'll cause some tension in your relationships. Persevere. But to persevere, I want you to remember who our God is. That's how we also will persevere. So I want you to consider God's intentions and God's authority as it it comes to his commands in the word. He's not just trying to make sure you do everything he said that you do to kind of control you. But instead, he is calling you closer to him in our relationship. 
God is the one that has called us out of death into life. We were disobedient to him, and while we were doing that, he sent his son. And so now that we have become alive in the spirit unto him, every other command now, which is to invite us into more life, to invite us into a closer relationship with him, that we may be transformed. But I know for me, I struggle with application and the times in which I forget who God is and what his intentions are. I see there's a bunch of rules. I come to the Bible sometimes like, oh, let me see what else I need to stop doing. Let me see what else I need to do differently. As Pastor Ryan pointed out in our first sermon series, our first installment of this series, I need to check my approach. If I constantly come to the word of God as corrective and constantly come to the word of God as challenging me, then it starts to be, again, a certain sort of works righteousness. If I do these things, I can check them off. I can walk with God. But Vertical Church, can I also remind you that the Word of God can encourage us? It can tell us who we are. We can find our identity in Christ and who God says that we are and the value that he has given us. When I'm reminded of all that God gave up and all that God went through, despite my inconsistency, then yes, I'm way more comfortable in my relationship with God. And if I trust that his intentions towards me are good, then I can trust the things he's telling me to do. But again, check our intentions. When we find ourselves pushing back against what God is calling us to do, I would say remind yourself of who God is and what his intentions are towards us. I want to point out specifically here in this text that the wise man, he is the goal. He is the wise builder. He takes the information and applies it. Yet, it does not remove the storm from his life. It does not. Jesus is telling you up front, hey, there will be difficult times. There is wind and rain, and it beats on this house. Vertical Church, just because we've given our lives to Christ doesn't mean broken things won't happen to us in this broken world. We will experience loss. Money will run out. People will promise one thing and then do a totally different other thing. People will mishandle us and hurt us. But even in those times, We have to love God by applying his word. Even in those difficult times, what God says is still true. Notice the text doesn't say once this man heard the information and applied it, that when the storm and winds and floods came, that it did not touch him because he was covered by the blood. That sounds good and it feels good. But again, the flip side of that is when we experience difficult things, we tend to say it's because we've done something wrong and we're not with God anymore. That's not always the case. There are some things that we endure for the glory of God. If you think about it, who better to go through something difficult than the one that is connected to God, that'll stick with God, and in the end, point to God's glory? So yes, we need to go through challenges in our marriage. Yes, we need to go through character flaws, because as we stick with God, it'll show everybody else, this God that I serve is real. He does restore. He does rebuild. And if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. So our application is not just about us. God's word will preserve us. There's a second point here I just want to make sure we walk away with. God's word will preserve us if we apply it. If we apply it. If we take the encouragement, if we take the correction, God will preserve us. The confession that we made to him, he will cover us and walk us through until the end times. But again, despite how we feel, despite what we say about ourselves, despite the surprises that come up, God is always there to provide for us and lead us through it if we follow him. So my last text as I prepare to take my seat is going to be in James. I know a lot of us that read the Bible are like, I know this brother going to hit that James text. Give me some time. Give me some time. I was going to get there. James 1, verses 22 through 35. James 1, verses 22 through 25. I'll read it for you in your hearing. It's on the screens. Praise God. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he is like. Personally, just how my brain works, I thought it was funny that in Matthew 7, Jesus is calling people foolish and lawless. And we get to James, and he's like, you're just forgetful. You just don't remember what you saw in the word. You got to kind of water it down a little bit if you aren't the called Messiah. So verse 24, for he looks at himself and goes away at once, forgetting what he was like. Verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, 
being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in all his doing. My first look at this text, my first thought, my first question was, what is that deception? What does that look like? I know for me, there's been times where I've heard sermons, and halfway through the sermon, I'm like, ooh, my mom needs to hear this. Ooh, ooh, I need to send this to my cousin. Let me send this to my friend, as if it's for somebody else and not me. Deception. There's been times where the first five to seven minutes of a sermon, oh, I know where this is going. I'm already doing that. That's not for me. I've mastered that one already. Decepticons. That's what that is. (laughs) To my transformer people, can't talk about deception without throwing in Decepticons. Sometimes we approach the basics of the Bible as if we don't need those things, as if we've mastered them. Can I be honest with you? Here at Vertical Church, we have growth tracks. Every couple months, we have a couple weeks where we engage the Word and we pause for questions and discussion. And the last one we did was foundations, the foundational principles of our faith, typically pitched to new people, people that are just coming to the faith, or you're thinking about committing to Christ, but you're not quite sure. And so I went. I went as a partner. We wanted to make sure we go to a couple growth tracks a year. And man, foundations had me in a chokehold. <laughs> about the second or third session in, we're talking about the centrality of Christ. This class is the basics for people that just converted. And I find myself realizing I always need to come back to, is Christ really center in my life? Seasons have changed for me. I have more people I'm godly responsible for. There's Adriana. There's Aria. There's Nathaniel. And God is expecting me to lead them well. I have to steward these people now. I'm responsible for them unto God. And so I realized my heart was starting to change. I got to make some money. If you want to take care of your wife, it's going to cost some money. If you want to provide for your children, it's going to cost some money. Everything is going up in price. And so I find myself looking for new jobs and going back to school and what do I got to do to get promoted and being frustrated when they're not promoting me. And I find myself reminding myself that I'm acting like God doesn't know I need to provide for this family. God honored my choice in wife, then gave me these children. He has a plan for them. I'm not doing this on my own. But if I make myself center, then it's all on me. I got to figure something out. God, I know what you're trying to do, but you're going too slow. I got to make something shake. I got to get out here and make something happen. Only to come back a few months later like, God, what was that thing you were saying? Because this is not working. But if I remember that God is the one that leads me as I lead my family, I can keep him center. Regardless of what the economy is doing, what the job is doing, how I feel, I can remind myself God is the one that provides, and he never lets his children go without. God gave me this family. He will lead us. But the centrality of Christ is something that I can always come to in different seasons and see, am I getting off center? Am I giving something else a chance to be what I build my life on? So finally, I want to focus on the definition of persevere. The definition of persevere. What does it mean to persevere? This is someone that persists in spite of counter-influences, opposition, and discouragement. Someone that persists in spite of counter-influences, opposition, and discouragement. Can I tell you the three times I don't want to apply God's word? It's when there's counter-influences, there's opposition, or I'm discouraged. How do you apply God's word when the thing I thought you were going to do, God, you never showed up? And you expect me to do what you said? I'll take a break. I'll take a break. How do I apply God's word when, as I'm applying it, there's direct opposition? People are ganging up. Oh, this is what Fred believes. Let's get him. Let's get him. Tracking me in conversations where now, let's get the Christian. It's easy to shrink away in those moments. I'm not going to apply this no more. I'll just keep this to myself. But instead, Vertical, I want to challenge us to persevere. Again, by remembering who God is, that his intention towards us is great. How do I know? Let's look at the gospel of Jesus Christ. When God created this world, it was perfect. There was no flaw in the world. But originally, we find that Adam and Eve decide they can do things better than how God designed it. They want it to be on the same level as God. Cautionary to us, let's not bring God down to our level, but instead, let's shape our lives around him. Sometimes I question God's decisions like, if that was me, I wouldn't have done it like that. But instead, I want to obey God because approving upon what God has already set in place Doing my own thing, that's sin. It manifests itself differently in our lives, but that's the original sin that has now been multiplied throughout the world. Now we find ourselves living in this broken world where there's not enough. There's divisions. 
there's racism, there's all kind of things that we all wish weren't here, yet we are the ones causing it in this perfect world that God created. In his love for us, he realized we could not fix this thing, and so he sends his son. He lives a perfect life, obedient to God, which we could not do. But because he's a just God, he has to just rule over the sin that we've committed, so the penalty had to be paid. And so Christ dies on behalf of our sin, dies a sinner's death, though he lived a perfect, obedient life. But it doesn't end there. God raised him from the dead, signifying to us that his sacrifice was accepted. And now we can follow Jesus into a relationship with God. Again, what we believe about Jesus being the Son of God is what saves our soul. But what matures us, what causes us to come alive furthermore and walk closer with God is our application of his word. And so now, as I close, a couple of things I want us to consider. I want us to consider how are we listening. Let's listen with aim. Let's listen attentively as we're reading the word. Let's investigate what we are reading when we read that word. The vertical church, let's move. Let's move. I'm not saying the first time you try to apply a scripture, you'll knock it out the park. Sometimes the best way we can be guided and make adjustments is when we actually start. You have a plan. You take step one and realize, let's go back, change this up a little bit. That's not quite right. And then step two looks a little different. Same thing with the word. If we listen in community, we can make sure we have a proper interpretation. Then we can set out to apply that word. So let's listen and tentatively investigate what we're listening to or reading in the word. But then let's move. And then finally, let's remember to persevere. When it gets difficult, I don't want you to be surprised by that. I want you to expect and know there will be opposition in this world as often as we try to follow God and do his will. We're not surprised. Instead, we persevere. And our strategy, our strength for perseverance comes from remembering that we are called to and walking with the one true and living God. He is undefeated. He is perfect in all of his ways. He is mighty in battle. So when you find yourself in a battle, run to the Lord, run to his word, and watch him fight that battle on your behalf. Watch the confidence that springs up in you, now knowing that, God, I've seen for myself. I've heard what's been said about God, but now I've seen for myself what that looks like. So application. We can't have a sermon about application that doesn't end in some application. A couple of things I want you to pray through. First thing I want you to pray through this week is, Father, help give me clarity. Help me to have clarity. Father, remind me of something right now that I know that I'm not applying. Sometimes we can bury things so deep in our hearts and in our minds that we just seem to forget. So I want you to pray this week, Father, remind me, show me something in the Word that I know, but I'm not applying it. Second thing I want you to pray through this week, Father, remind me of where my comfort and my desire has become my foundation. My comfort and my desire has become my foundation. Part of the tension that we feel when it comes to applying God's Word, specifically for me, I can't speak for y'all, The main thing I struggle with when it comes to applying God's word is our intentions are different. See, God is perfect, and I am imperfect. I literally can't think on his same level, but I make decisions as if we're making them together, (laughs) as if I know as much as God. And then secondly, another thing that challenges my thing is I try to move for comfort. My main goal in life is what's going to make me comfortable, whereas God's goal in life is what's going to bring him glory. So there's tension. When an application step causes me to be uncomfortable, I will back up. So I want us to pray this week, God, where am I choosing my comfort over your will for my life? And then finally, maybe you're somebody that finds yourself having no desire to apply the word, still wrestling with this idea of what you're saying sounds good, but I don't even know if I want to do it. I want you to pray for your desire. I want you to pray, God, give me a desire to even want to apply your word. Because again, if you're not sold on applying it, I guarantee you, you are viewing God the wrong way. There is something about your approach, something about your perspective and understanding of God that is not accurate with this true and loving God that lives and wants us to live and be in relationship with him. So those are the three things I want you to pray for this week. Father, give me clarity of where I'm not applying. Father, show me where I'm choosing comfort over your will. And Father, give me a desire. Give me a desire to want to apply your word.